Female passengers in the 21st century traveling by bus. There will be a special bus service. And traveling by air. After sitting for five hours on the train, it gets very soul destroying. The railways have been in chaos since the crash at Hatfield. Already a long journey is now much, much longer. Tonight, Panorama reveals why Railtrack lost control of its rail network. I think there was an extraordinary arrogance in Railtrack. And why the government's claims about rebuilding our railways may not add up. This is Leeds Railway Station. There will be a special bus service. For much of last month, it looked more like a bus station. The owner is Railtrack, Britain's biggest private monopoly. Railtrack were re-signalling the station. There will be a special bus service. They promised to finish the job by the new year, but they took twice as long. This only added to the grief of some commuters already suffering from a chaotic rail network. Absolutely appalling. Um, I arrive at Leeds every day. I'm a commuter from Saltair, about 14 miles away. Every day I arrive at work absolutely fuming and late invariably. Um, there isn't a service to speak of since November. Special announcement. There will be a special bus service in operation between this station and East Garnwell. Can we ask you what you think of the service? I don't think there's any service. Well, you've got a bus. Yeah, so what? The train's due to leave at five past ten. I've got a connection to make in London, which I'm not going to make. I've got, a, I've got to go down to Bournemouth. It's probably going to take me going on for ten hours. The marathon to Bournemouth is also down to rail track. Across the network, there have been over 1,000 speed restrictions. Since October, the railways have suffered one of their greatest crises, as rail tracks contractors have struggled to get the network back together. Following the derailment at Hatfield of an express train on this line out of King's Cross, rail track feared the rail network was full of undiscovered defects. One of the many thousands of passengers whose lives have been turned upside down is James James, who commutes daily from Doncaster to London. I am a passenger. Before Hatfield, the journey was one hour and 35 minutes. First, rail track said the timetable would be back to normal by November, then December, then February. Now it's Easter. Just leaving Peterborough. We've left on time, according to the new timetable. According to the old timetable, we wouldn't have even stopped here. Sometimes it's taken James eight hours to get to work and back. Waiting at home for James is Samantha and seven year old Samuel. Before Hatfield, James got home in time to put him to bed. Since then, contact with his family has been by phone. Are you on the train? It says every train is cancelled until 9.30. Just to make sure we're on time. Well, someone will be in bed when you get home. I never eat with my family. So now I'm coming in, I've had a sandwich and a drink on the train, and I'm straight to bed. I feel like being a single parent family during the week. That sounds really weird, but we, we sort of do things together, and James isn't really a part of it because we can't make him a part of what we're doing because he's never here to be part of it. At the height of the chaos, it was hard to know what was coming or going. GNER, who runs the route of the legendary Flying Scotsman, had to stop and start through 100 speed restrictions. However, did Britain's railways suffer such an ignominious collapse? Today, I'm travelling on the main line from Newcastle to London. 
to find some answers and to ask some questions. The journey south on this GNER Express takes me to York, Doncaster and past the crash site at Hatfield onto London. To understand the roots of this crisis, we need to go back to rail privatisation. The system that replaced British Railways is so complicated, most people struggle to understand it. GNER doesn't actually own this train, it leases it. Nor does it own the bridges, signals and tracks over which it runs. They're owned by Railtrack, the only privatised track authority in the world. Which is why its sell-off was so fiercely contested. How often have you turned on the radio and heard another devastating blow has been dealt to the government's plans to privatise the railways? Rubbish. Privatisation is happening and it will bring better services to passengers. There were soothing assurances that in private hands what was seen as a national asset would be carefully maintained. The interest of the travelling public and the interest of our shareholders are identical in producing a better, more reliable, more punctual railway. The government will soon be selling shares in Railtrack. Railtrack was a rushed cut price sale by the Tories. In fact, they almost gave it away by writing off £1.2 billion of BR's debt. Whatever the failings of British Rail, one thing was certain. At least you knew who was in charge. Now the system has been broken into 100 different pieces, all held together by legal contracts. Welcome to the most fragmented railway in the world. Undoubtedly, the different parts of the railway don't really stick together. The trouble with legal contracts is that uh, people take a contractual uh, approach to matters, and they may not necessarily do the common sense thing if it disadvantages their companies. Rail track added to these problems by not checking to see just how worn out the track it now owned was. Although custodians of a vital national asset, the company failed to make a proper engineering assessment of its state, something the present rail regulator who oversees rail track is still urging them to do. It's the company's responsibility to understand the condition, the capability and the capacity of their assets. They failed properly to understand the condition of their network and that, I think, has led to some very significant difficulties uh, down the road. Rail track entrusted maintenance of the track to a multitude of contractors. This further fragmented and already fragmented railway. In February 1997 came an early warning that the new system could lead to maintenance problems. Seven freight wagons crashed over a viaduct at Bexley in Kent. Miraculously, no one died, though four people were seriously injured. The derailment was caused by rotting track timbers. The contractors had known this for 18 months, and so had Railtrack. All Railtrack had to do was monitor the contract, and they didn't even do that. Here was a piece of the infrastructure which was palpably beginning to look very, very aged and was prone to failure. It had been identified several times, and that information had gone to Railtrack. Railtrack appeared to have failed to monitor what had been going on and to act to ensure that the network was safe. And as a result of that, we, um, we decided the matter was so, was so serious, particularly after we'd drawn attention to the company and, and Railtrack about this, that we prosecuted both the contractors and Railtrack. Following Bexley, poor track condition, sloppy maintenance, and a failure by Railtrack to check on their contractors led to a series of derailments across the country. The problems at Bexley and the derailments that followed had to do with Railtrack's failure to carry out a relatively simple task, which was to monitor the work of the contractors. Mm -hmm. That's not a very testing task, is it? Well, it doesn't sound testing if you say it quickly, but the reality is that Railtrack was not set up with the people to actually itself conduct detailed inspection uh, and then verification You're saying and you audit their staff? No, I'm saying that those functions were principally carried out by our contractors. But you'd accept you didn't change your approach to contractors as fast as you could or should have done? I certainly think, in retrospect, we probably should have made more changes more quickly. The way Railtrack was managing the maintenance of its network through contractors was to become a common theme. 
and ultimately a major factor in the crash at hatfield.